I guess it's still morning. Good morning. Appreciate uh, your being here. I uh, just uh, want to make a couple of comments uh, about uh, the past week. Um, I think generally what we saw this week, uh, we did have in the Senate the uh, uh, majorities did announce their budget targets. We have not seen the budget bills yet, so we are at the halfway mark. Uh, we have not got a budget. We have some targets that I think are, uh, I guess, revealing a little bit of the direction that the uh, majorities are going to go in. I think nothing remarkably surprising, not remarkably different, I think, than what we expected. Uh, about an eight and a half in, uh, percent increase in spending, three billion dollar increase in spending, uh, and about a two billion dollar increase in taxes. Um, we don't know yet the detail of their tax plan. They haven't talked about publicly a, uh, a surcharge or whatever happened in the House. I guess the governor called it piling on, which I thought was a revealing comment. It seems to imply that what the governor done is already bad and what the House is doing is even worse. I guess maybe that would be the right comment. I don't know if the Senate is going to do that or not. We don't know any details. But about a $2 billion increase in taxes. And this is, of course, remember, that we're solving a hundred and or, I'm sorry, about a six hundred twenty seven million dollar shortfall, in the deficit so called, between the increase in revenue and the increase in spending. Obviously we don't believe that this is the right direction for the state. We don't believe this is the right approach that we should be taking for the budget. Uh, the targets that they did announce uh, uh, Cutting Health and Human Services obviously was a little bit of a surprise. I think it was a surprise to some of the Democrats, judging from the comments that we read and heard on their side. I don't think that their chair of their committees was were maybe involved in those discussions. They seem to be a surprise to some of the rest of us that with the two billion dollar increase in taxes that they were still uh, uh, looking at uh, cutting spending in uh, health and human services. So uh, we'll see what their details of their uh, budget look like. Um, the exchange is uh, the I guess they've signed into law. Uh, obviously, uh, we uh, think that that at this point has been their signal accomplishment. And the other side, uh, significant tax increase associated with the exchange. Uh, we think that uh, this is going to have negative impact on the uh, economic uh, climate for the state, on choices for consumers, for insurance. Uh, we're very, uh, of course, uh, troubled by the process that they went through, uh, despite all the talk about bipartisanship and working with the uh, Republicans. And if there was ever an opportunity to have bipartisanship on a major piece of legislation, this certainly would have been that opportunity. Uh, tells us that there is not a great deal of interest on the part of the Democrats to seek out or try to uh, have that uh, bipartisan conversation, because there clearly was a lot of interest uh, by many members on our side to work with them in a genuine way to create a bipartisan bill, which they, that, which they uh, rejected. Um, so I think uh, looking forward to the to the break, uh, uh, we're going to go back and talk to uh, uh, our constituents in the district. Uh, from what I can tell, from what we're hearing, I think uh, people are urging us not to do harm to the economy, not to pile on additional taxes, not to uh, do things that would slow down the growth. This is always the question we're asking. How do these additional taxes help grow the economy? How does this additional spending that's being proposed help grow the economy? Uh, what we're seeing is a sort of a, we need to have more taxes because uh, we campaigned on having more taxes and we're going to spend more money because we have more money to spend. That seems to be the argument of the DFL budget. I don't think a lot of people think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's not helping us grow the economic uh, strength of the state of Minnesota. It's not helping us become more competitive and that's what we need to focus on. Um, I guess just on a final note, uh, uh, Vice President Biden has not called me, and, uh, <laughs> but I'm certainly willing to take his call. So I don't know, I don't know who's next. Good morning. Um, well, in the House, obviously, the big news as well was the announcement of, of budget targets. And uh, as a new member of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, I have to admit I found it a little bit frustrating uh, that a a new leadership and, and party that's come in. Um, crowing about transparency, uh, refuses to give us their total budget spending uh, plans for, for the new biennium. Um, those, those targets, as you probably are aware, is what they call net spending. So if any fees are raised within a particular budget area and then spent 
that does not show up on the sheets. Uh, again, the total amount of taxes that are planned to be raised is somewhat of a question as well. So, uh, I, you know, I pressed Chair Carlson in about as many ways as I could think of to ask him what the overall sort of gross spending number is. Uh, wasn't able to get that from him. But what we do know is that um, they are planning to spend at least $38.7 billion. That's about a 9.2% increase. Uh, which doesn't, again, include any fees and that that may added, be added into the various areas of the budget um, as those budget bills are put together. So uh, a 9.2% incre increase is, is more than the governor has proposed. Uh, his original proposal was about 7.6%. And I think, uh, again, this is a conversation that Minnesotans need to have with their legislators and uh, we need to hear from the public on what is the right amount of increasing spending uh, for the state of Minnesota. Uh, what is the right amount that allows our private sector economy to continue to recover? We had some good news with the jobs numbers that were just announced. Uh, I believe we're about a thousand jobs shy of pre-recession levels. That's great news. And uh, I think the last thing we want to do is to squelch any of that recovery, to squelch any of that job growth and economic activity that's happening. Uh, that should be all of our uh, first priority and top line um, um, effort as we move into this budget process. So again, we will look forward to what may be uh, coming through the process and the opportunity to have some input uh, into those bills as, as they're being put together. Uh, we're still hoping and looking for opportunities to try to work with the Democrats and with our leadership on the other side of the aisle to try to bring, I, I think, perhaps some, um, some moderation to some of these proposals. Um, you know, the, the word overreach has been used a few times. Uh, and from the emails that I'm getting from constituents and from what I'm hearing, there is a raft of concern over some of these proposals. Um, obviously, we heard from business loud and clear about the business-to-business -business tax proposals, which have kind of been rolled back. Um, we've had some very controversial uh, proposals moving through committee, uh, unionization of, of small home-based businesses, primarily women, with regards to, to home daycares. Um, that has been really fast-tracked through committee. Um, complaints uh, bipartisanly from members about that issue who feel it's, it's moving too fast and without enough input, members not being allowed to ask questions in committee or being cut off. Uh, again, for a leadership that came in with wanting to have a conversation with Minnesotans, talking about transparency, involving the public in the process, uh, I'm not sure that their actions are living up to their words with that with regards to those efforts. So um, maybe the break is coming at a good time. People will, will uh, get out into their districts, uh, be holding town meetings or seminars, and uh, collect a little input from the people they represent and come back with a slightly different perspective when we reconvene in April. Well, good morning. You know, uh, as the DFL continues to, as uh, Senator Han has called it, as well as Governor Dayton, continue to pile on an already overburdened Minnesota taxpayer with $2.4 billion in new taxes, which is what the House proposal is, here are a few things for Minnesotans to consider during this uh, spring break. Minnesota families are, are finalizing their, their spring break plans, their travel plans right now. And they need to be aware that they're also paying for not only their own travel plans and their own trips, but also trips for artists in Minnesota with their own taxpayer dollars. And I'll give you an example. A report this week showed that uh, an art, we were paying for an artist out of general funds to go to Bora Bora and spend an extended stay in Bora Bora so that she can, quote, let's make sure I get this right, so that she can focus on paintings that show colonization and subjugation that's been caused by the military and the tourist industry in the area. So while you're looking at going up north to the cabin, looking at how you're going to pay for that, realize that you're also paying for folks to go to Bora Bora to be able to study paintings. That's what the DFL majorities are asking you to pay more in taxes for. Not for education reform, not for, for looking at the achievement gap and for addressing the achievement gap. You're paying for artists to go to Bora Bora. And in the House this week, the chair of the HHS Finance Committee said that, you know what, I might resign over this, over his budget target. Well, I'll tell you what, if you're going to resign over a $600 million increase to an $11.4 billion HHS budget, Representative Abler and the Republicans are ready to lead because that's what Minnesotans want. 
They don't want threats to resign over a $600 million increase to your budget. What they want is for you to lead, and Republicans are prepared to do that. In the House Finance, the Education Finance Committee last night, they passed a new unfunded mandate to our schools that's going to require them to provide training, to provide for additional staff and personnel, both in the Minnesota Department of Education as well as in our schools, to address what they consider a bullying problem in our schools. Unfunded mandate. When we asked about it, where is the fiscal note? Where is, how are we going to find the money to, to pay for this? The answer was, we're going to do that later. We'll find another way to do that later. And I thought this was going to be the session of transparency, the session of no gimmicks, no shifts. And here we go again. It's time to stop that. It's time to fund the things that we know are priorities. And it's not artists going to Bora Bora. It's things that we know affect the achievement gap and that we can fix. The Minnesotans are asking us to do. And we're not seeing that right now from the DFL majorities. And as we go to our districts during the week and talk to them about what's happening here in St. Paul, that's the message that we're, we're going to give. And the message I am sure we'll receive, which is what we've been receiving over the past couple of months, is stop raising my taxes. Thank you. One of the things that came out of the hearing uh, on guns last night was the pressure on GOP suburban Republican legislators on the gun issue. Do you see any of that sort of pressure uh, from your constituencies, you all talk about going out and listening to your constituents. Where are, particularly in the suburban districts, where are your constituencies on, on things like uh, on, on gun control issues? I've heard from a number of constituents in my area on this issue, and um, probably one of the issues I've heard most from um, so far this session. And uh, overwhelmingly, the concern is, is um, overreach or infringement into Second Amendment rights. So I don't think uh, there's going to be uh, a real um, concern from uh, Republican, suburban, or otherwise regarding, um, you know, some of, the, some of the proposals that have been put out there because there are reasonable solutions that have been put forth on a bipartisan basis. Representative Hillstrom uh, introduced uh, legislation that had, I don't know, 73, 74, 75 co-sponsors. Um, it can pass. Um, it takes great steps at getting at criminals and people who uh, shouldn't have guns uh, and, and cracking down on that, straw purchasers, um, improving our, our criminal data systems and the data sharing that goes on. So it makes some real concrete strides, and it's something that could actually pass. I think, again, that's where our efforts should be. Um, legislating and governing is about the art of mastering what is possible, and this is possible to do this session. With that, um, does that does Representative Hillstrom's bill have a path forward in, in either the House or, or Senator Ortman's bill in the Senate? Um, do we do any of you or do you know of plans to move to amend it on the floor when it eventually comes up? Well, uh, Senator Ortman's bill, which is the companion to Representative Hillstrom's bill, uh, they took it up in Senator Latz's committee, uh, and I believe they kind of. Uh, <laughs> They did violence to it, I guess. Is, but <laughs> I don't know what they. Uh, I, I don't know what the plan is. The majority is obviously going to make their decisions on on what happens to that bill. I think Representative Loon is correct. If there is going to be a bill that will succeed through the process, it'll be some version of uh, Representative Hillstrom's bill. Um, uh, I, I don't know the path in the in the Senate. I have had discussions with Senator Bach about this uh, about this issue. Uh, I think there is a desire uh, to have some kind of uh, bill that would reflect the concerns that many Minnesota citizens have to uh, uh, reflect the priorities that we all believe, that, that we want Minnesotans to be safe, that, that we want the laws to be enforced. Uh, but uh, I can just reiterate the expressions that Representative Loon made from the mail that I've gotten. Overwhelmingly, people are concerned about overreach about passing laws that really don't get at the concerns or the problems that, that uh, uh, we've seen in the news. Uh, and, and so I think that some of the bills that have gotten a lot of uh, 
oppressed are, are really beyond the scope of what people think we need to do. And so I think you have to look at what is practical, what is really going to be focused on solving some practical problems. And I think some of the things in the hillstrom ortman bill are things that could get passed and I think are things that could have some practical effect. Uh, so I think if anything gets done, it will be some version of the elements in that bill. But I don't know yet what the pathway is, and I think the majorities are going to have to figure that out. Senator, given the um, polling, and I know polling is all over the ballpark, uh, right. but are you somewhat surprised because uh, are you somewhat surprised at the overwhelming amount of mail you receive from Eden Prairie people? Is the concern of overreach on the Second Amendment? Does that surprise you? Well, and I, I get a lot of mail from around the state. I okay. think partly okay. because of my role as uh, okay. the caucus. But uh, what about your constituent? Constituent, and I probably get the same mail that Representative Loon gets. She's my rep, so uh, we probably get a lot of the same uh, kinds of. Uh, uh, emails and letters. Uh, and, and no, I, I think in a suburban district you have a lot of people that are sportsmen, uh, a lot of people that grew up uh, hunting, familiar with uh, uh, guns, have a lot of family connections. Uh, my son married into a family. They go deer hunting every year. It's a family tradition. Uh, people in Minnesota are familiar with guns most for the most part. And, and, and uh, when they hear things about that there are going to be some very severe restrictions on the ability to pass guns on to family members or members of a hunting party or to do things that they've been doing in their family for years and years and years and that these are going to become problematic. Uh, and they say, well, how does that, how does that affect uh, the crime or how does that affect the, I mean, it, it, it just does, the connection isn't there. And, and so they look at this as, uh, a reaction, a political reaction that is overreached, that is unconnected to any real problem. And I think the pushback is, why are you doing this? Why are you making my life more difficult? Is it just a political posture? Is that, is that all this is? And so that, that is the substance of a lot of the mail that we get, that I've gotten, is uh, focus on solving a problem, focus on doing something that is going to actually uh, have some effect, instead of just uh, making a political statement. Given what you all have mentioned about the difficulties trying to get, uh, trying to work with Democrats to modify the bills that are coming out, after the break, is there any plan to re release your own competing budget plans, either in the House or Senate? I know from, we're not going to release a budget. Uh, doing a budget is a lot of work. Uh, our staff got cut. I don't know if you heard about this, but our staff got cut a little bit, and uh, uh, we do not have the uh, ability to put together a budget plan, and uh, we're not planning to do it. I don't believe the House is either. Uh, uh, they can talk about that. But, but we certainly have ideas on how to do a budget and how to structure a budget, and we've talked about that, and we're going to offer our suggestions after we see the DFL uh, budget. We have not seen it yet, of course. Um, but we uh, we are going to offer our alternative suggestions on how we could approach this differently. And it's very similar to the things we've been talking about. We don't believe you need to raise tax rates to uh, successfully manage the problem that we have today. Uh, we showed that two years ago you could take a $5 billion shortfall and manage that without raising tax rates. I think you can manage a $627 million shortfall without raising taxes as well. And I think most people in the state of Minnesota would agree with that. Representative Bloom, could you talk about what you're hearing on gay marriage in your district and also in your chamber? They've had kind of a test vote in the Senate, but the Speaker today said he will not bring up same-sex marriage if they don't have the vote. Right. Um, I have had a number of meetings with constituents. Um, I had a town meeting a couple of weeks ago, uh, just an open forum, probably an hour and a half, and I got one question at the very end. Um, I have a survey out. Uh, it's out on my on my house website online, and about 10,000 copies are in the mail as we speak. So I'm gathering information for my constituents on it. Um, again, you know, my district was one that rejected the constitutional amendment by 60%, uh, um, and so I, I think it's really incumbent on me to to listen to my constituents, to ask them what they meant by their vote. And so, you know, that's that's as much as I know about where my district is right now. Does that mean you're undecided? Uh, it means I'm stepping back to listen to my constituency, um, and and to see again where they where they lie on that issue. I know just from individual conversations with people, and again, this is not scientific, but uh, anecdotal um, conversations are that um, some people voted no, but 
their no vote did not mean they were in favor of changing the definition of marriage in our in our statute. So I think there's a range of opinions within that 60 percent, and I'm trying to divine where my district is on that. If the results of that survey come back and show that more than 50 percent of your district supports legalizing same-sex marriage, what will your vote be? Uh, again, I will continue to talk to um, constituents in that through the break, through April, through you know, the end of the session, and develop an opinion if this comes to a vote that I think best represents my district in total on this. And you know, at this point, I couldn't venture. I couldn't venture on where that will be. Do you know if any of their colleagues are in the same position? Have you spoke with others who are you know, figuring I, it out? I think all. Um, uh, members are listening and hearing from um, some mem you know constituents in their district on this issue but again it's not an issue that our caucus has, has has met about and developed an opinion on again this is not an initiative that we are pushing this is something that the DFO majority has placed on, on their on their list and so I think it'll be you know if they insist on pushing it forward um, it'll be incumbent on them to to develop the votes and not to pass it do you think they should uh, have a vote this year, just to settle it? My personal opinion, no. 